is now being recorded. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Recycled Water Committee meeting for the Governor's Water Augmentation Council. It is Friday, January 26, 2018. It's just after 1 p.m., and this meeting is being held at the Department of Water Resources here on the fourth floor Verde Room. My name is John Kameek. I'm the Director of Miranda Water and uh, representing Southern Arizona Water Disease Users Association, as well as the Recycled Water Chair um, at this, from this committee. And I welcome everybody here today, and we're going to quickly go around the room. Uh, we'll go through the table first, and then we'll go around the outside of the room on the people that are here. And then we'll, uh, do we have communications with, is there people on the phone on this? No one on the phone. Nobody on the phone. Okay, we're just recording. Okay. So just in this room. So go to my right. Jeff Biggs, Tucson Water. I'm Brad Hill, City of Flagstaff. I'm Brian Payne, Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. Uh, Rob McCandless, Brown and Caldwell. I'm Chris McVie, the Community Water Coalition. Alex Smith, Bureau of Reclamation. Lawrence Marquez, Bureau of Reclamation. Zach Richards, ADWR. Martin Stiles, ADWR. Jerry Walker, ADWR. Wendy Broly, Brown and Caldwell. Jerry Carlisle, Vice Chairman, Stenberg District. John Munderlow, Water Resource Manager, Town of Frisco Valley. <coughs> Kelly Hanswell, City of Sedona. Scott Miller with APF. Nathan Lehman, Bureau of Reclamation. Frank Wylam, City of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Brian Moore is the water manager. Shivani Shadi DQ. Anthony Beckham, water resources manager for Arizona Game and Fish Department. Great. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. So, um, just a little recap of what our activities have been before we get to our, our special guest presenter today. Um, you know, the Recycled Water Committee, and many of you have been participating in it, we, we've been one of the first committees to put forward resolutions uh, to the full uh, GWAC, and that happened this morning, uh, their, their acceptance of those resolutions, and, um, and their consensus on moving them forward to the Governor's Office. So, I just want to congratulate everyone who's been working over the last several months uh, with this committee and, uh, and drafting those resolutions and those ideas. The one was the elimination of the 2025 sunset on effluent generated credits, long term storage credits. And then the other one is changing the managed underground storage facility credit generation uh, for effluent, uh, effluent managed underground storage facilities. So, so we'll see what happens um, after that point with those, but that doesn't stop the work of this committee. So, over the last uh, couple meetings, uh, we've been examining uh, other ways. Um, that Arizona can augment their water supplies or come up with different ways to um, treat their water supplies and make them last longer or augment them in a certain way that is going to help uh, the growth of this state across the board, rural, through the urban areas um, with new water management strategies. We had some presentations in July from Flagstaff and from the Water Reuse Arizona about the, about the one water world and where things are happening nationally and globally as far as water integrated management strategies. And now, at this meeting today, I am happy to uh, present uh, Wendy Broly from Brown Caldwell San Diego office. And she's going to talk to us about integrated water management. And Wendy, I will turn the floor over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, John. And I'll, uh, I'll kind of be up and about. I may not stand up in a specific location here. But I'll start with just a little bit of an introduction um, and do I just can I go straight through it like this? Oh, look at that. All right. I hope you don't mind if I put some stuff up here. All right. Perfect. Okay. Yes, you can write on my notes. <laughs> Tell me everything I said. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I really am very excited to be able to uh, to be here and to talk about this. Uh, Blueprint for One Water, um, which was a project that I had the opportunity to do on behalf of the Water Research Foundation. But before I get into that, I'll tell you just a little bit about who I am. Um, I am with Brown and Caldwell. I've been with Brown and Caldwell for about four years. Um, my background is actually in membrane technology, and I have a passion for potable reuse. And um, very quickly, at Brown and Caldwell, I realized that there was a real culture of collaborative um, collaboration in general, and 
um, a recognition of the importance, not just in potable reuse, but in water management in general, to take a more integrated one water approach to things. And it was very much in line with my own passion. And so I asked for Brown and Caldwell as not only their water reuse leader, but their one water leader. We actually kind of coordinate ourselves um, in this sort of more one water fashion. We consider ourselves one water engineers. And, um, and so it was out of that interest that we engaged with the Water Research Foundation in this specific project, which I'm going to be talking to you guys about. And hopefully, um, out of this discussion, you'll all have, you know, maybe some insights, things that you hope to be able to, um, uh, to bring to this conversation for you as part of this group. Um, and so, so I'm going to start there. I'm going to start a little bit um, more focused on this particular project, the development of the blueprint for One Water. Um, but then I also have a little bit more material on sort of a real-time application of what One Water in action might look like, and it's happening currently in California around the topic of declining flows, which certainly does have an impact on how we um, manage these systems with respect to water use efficiency, uh, but also recycled water production and quality, as well as impacts on the other systems. So I can get into that depending on how things go, how much time we have. Um, hopefully that will be of use to all of you as well. Um, so the blueprint for One Water is, um, uh, it, it actually wrapped up uh, at the beginning of last year. Um, and so we've had an opportunity to talk to a number of different groups on this very topic, and it seems to be something that is has become a beneficial guide, and that's really how it was always intended, something that provided tactical guidance on how to develop one water framework. Um, and it was really uh, driven in large part by an absolutely fantastic research manager, Katie Henderson, um, a project advisory committee that consisted of uh, agencies that were really um, on the leading edge of developing these types of one water pro frameworks and programs, um, including LA Department of Water and Power, uh, Denver Water, and New York City DEP. Um, we had participation also from WE and RF before they merged with the Water Research Foundation, which in and of itself is just a great example of how one water really is the way we need to start doing things moving forward. Um, our research team consisted of Cindy Paulson, who is Brown and Caldwell's Chief Technical Officer, and she really has made um, a career out of being able to facilitate these collaborative regional um, programs in order to accomplish um, really complex and challenging goals in water management. And myself and Lynn Stevens, um, one of our colleagues at Brown and Caldwell, um, acted as co-principal investigators. All right, so today what, what I thought we would do is I'll start by um, talking a little bit about what we mean by one water. One water is one of those terms that people come to the table with all sorts of different kind of um, expectations and perspectives and perceptions. Um, and for good reason, it's a pretty broad topic. And so we'll, we'll get into um, what we mean by that or how we define it as part of this project. And then also a little bit about the driving forces for reliability and resilience and the movement towards one water in general. Um, I am then going to walk through the various phases within the blueprint for one water. This is sort of the roadmap um, that we've laid out. And I'm going to focus it instead of talking about the specifics of each of the steps, talk about it more in terms of the case studies that we looked at, because this project was very much informed by the utility experiences that, um, that engaged on it. And I hope that that's a value. Some of them may seem very much in line with what you guys are looking at, and some of them may be focused on different things. And we'll talk a little bit by, about why that is, um, but I, I hope that this is good food for thought, at least for you guys. And I hope also that this can be informal enough that if you have any questions along the way, don't hesitate to stop me. We can dig in a little bit deeper. Um, I may pause a couple of times just to see if you guys have any specific feedback. And one of the areas, after we talk a little bit about what we mean by one water, that would be really helpful for me is to have a better sense from some of you as to what has really um, brought this conversation to bear for you and what you hope to get out of it. So moving on. Um, 
One of the reasons why we started on this project, the Water Research Foundation has a focus area on integrated water management. Um, and, you know, there is some work done in the development of the research agenda uh, that Brown and Caldwell actually participated in. Um, there was a, a project that was done in collaboration between Water Research Foundation and WENRF earlier on called Pathways to One Water, and it sort of framed up the characteristics of successful one water programs. But what they were starting to hear from agencies was, yes, yes, we, we definitely agree this is the way to, to go, but we need a little bit more tactical guidance on, on how to develop these frameworks, how do we engage and move forward through this process. So that's really what this project was all about, it was trying to get a better sense of the, the tactical guidance, the steps that a, an agency might go through. Um, it was in, um, the, the, the blueprint itself was really informed by a, a broad range of perspectives worldwide. We, um, we began with an, a survey that we distributed internationally. We got more than 800 responses from water professionals, which broke records for the Water Research Foundation. So we know that this is a topic of great interest to folks. Um, and then we held about 10 one-on-one -on -one interviews with those that responded having already moved through some of this process already, either in the implement, uh, planning or implementation stages of a one water approach. And then we held a two-day workshop with more than 35 water professionals from across the country as well as Australia um, to better inform this roadmap and the, the various steps that an agency might need to go through. Wendy, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, back on the the slide before it's so mm -hmm. back at the back one more is where I kind of so um, you said utilities and then on the next one you said 800 water professionals I was just trying to get an idea of um, so we obviously have utilities we have cities we have agencies what is the nature of the people that you're seeing or, you know, at what level are you seeing that discussion? That's an excellent question. And so the survey went out to a really, through, through a couple of different channels, including uh, we actually leveraged, is that, does anyone here get BC Water News? Okay, so, you know, a compilation of different water-related news coming to you, and so we have a subscriber base through that that is, includes more than just utilities. Um, we've got uh, folks, you know, what, what, the reason we said water professionals is because it really did look at a broad range of, of folks, whether that was consultants um, or uh, folks, you know, regulators or um, other government agencies or utilities, um, and at those utilities, you know, from staff level all the way up. So there was no specific subset, subgroup that we were targeting. We really were trying to get a sense of who's engaging in something related to One Water, who's interested in this topic, what in particular are you focused on? And, um, and so we were able to, to leverage that survey to help inform some of the direction that we took the conversation with our one-on-one um, -on -one interviews as well as the workshop. But a lot of the guidance, a lot of the like step-by-step -step guidance was mostly informed by the workshop <laughs> itself because that's when we were able to create an environment for information sharing between agencies that were boots on the ground going through this or have already gone through it. So it's informed by a lot of those lessons learned um, about what worked and what didn't work along the way. Does that answer your question? Okay. Right. So, um, so one of the very first things that we did was we realized that there was a lot of people were on all sorts of different pages with respect to what one water means. And I think there's a lot of confusion because um, we refer to one water in different ways. Like, for instance, you've probably heard water is water is water. That concept of, you know, this is all one water and we need to, um, we need to manage it from that perspective. Um, so that's more of a conceptual what one water is. But what we were trying to figure out was one water as an approach. And so this is ultimately what, what we came to. We developed the, de the definition and then we, um, you know, kind of refined it with the group at the workshop. And it is that water, one water is an integrated planning and implementation approach. I'll move over here so everybody can see it so that people 
getting blocked by me. One Water is an integrated planning and implementation approach to managing finite water resources for long-term resilience and reliability, meeting both community and ecosystem needs. So it, I think I'd underline here, it's an integrated planning and implementation approach. It goes beyond the concept. This is something that is, the approach itself can be quite common from one place to the next. But what you're tackling in any given location can look very, very different. And I think that's one of the reasons why sometimes these conversations can get challenging because from one place to the next, a one water issue is going to look very, very different. And so when we all came to, into the room for the workshop, we asked our workshop participants to um, introduce themselves and to give us a tweet style version of what one water was to them and their agency. And so we found this is like one of the first like light bulbs was, gosh, it looks so different from one place to the next, and it is very site specific. Um, some examples, we've got SFPUC is looking at matching the right resource uh, to, uh, to the right use for that fit for purpose concept. Um, in Tucson, I hope this is right, Jeff. They said that it was stormwater as a resource. Um, but I know that Tucson's looking at other things as well, but this was one of the hot topics for them when we did the, um, the workshop. New York is looking at becoming energy neutral. Philadelphia is taking a holistic approach to pollutant reduction in their area. Austin Water is looking at gaining resilience into the future, and Denver Water is focused on an integrated approach to urban water management. So you start to see there's a significant diversity among those types of perspectives, and that is perfectly fine. Um, in fact, this became the very first step of the blueprint was define, your one, define what one water is for you, um, because what you're trying to tackle can be accomplished through one water approach, um, but you need to know exactly what you're up to. All right, so I'm going to give some kind of broad national sort of drivers towards moving in this direction. And then I, I also included a slide um, just sort of prompting some of my understanding of the Arizona issues or drivers, but I'd really be interested in getting your perspective there as well. But one of the, one of the foundational kind of challenges that we're faced with is a steady, steady increase in temperature. Um, as of last year, at least, we had had three record-breaking years with respect to temperature. Three of the hottest years on record occurred in 2014, 2015, and 2016, to the point where we actually saw like a half-degree increase in temperature just in the last like decade alone. It is pretty shocking if you think about the impact that that can have on our water quantities, water qualities, and even things like sea level rise creating real challenges for our water systems and water agencies. Um, of course, we're seeing, as a result of climate change, more extreme um, precipitation events, longer droughts. Uh, I know, it, at least in, in California, we're, you know, we don't talk about drought like it's some big surprise and we expect it, but now we're seeing the intensity and the duration extending and we're having to manage accordingly. Um, but this, this whole issue is driving us to really think about um, water in new ways. We're having to look at storage a little bit differently. We're having to look at um, demand management, and we, we certainly see a renewed ethic around demand management, but then water supply diversification and looking to alternative supplies to be able to help us manage more locally. We've got significant issues with respect to aging infrastructure, creating a insatiable need for funding um, over the next many years. And um, unfortunately, what we're finding is that we've still got significant gaps and where is this money going to come from? We don't have enough money to address the kind of aging infrastructure challenges that we're faced with. Um, and that really leads to these issues of financial sustainability. How can agencies and, and the water industry remain um, financially sustainable as we tackle all of these challenges? This is um, uh, a study that came out of the uh, Brookings Institute looking at um, operating ratios um, of drinking water utilities. And this is just a snapshot. I'm not trying to pick on any one of these. Hopefully none of you are 
on this list. Yeah, so we're good. Um, but but the point being, when you you start to see that a lot of these uh, agencies, a lot of these municipalities are seeing their operating expenses exceeding their total revenue. Um, and so on, on top of this concern, you've got the fact that we've got real affordability issues um, across the country. A Michigan State University actually did a study recently that showed that within the next five years, if water rates continue to increase and the uh, the trajectory that they currently are on, 36% of Americans are going to be struggling with water affordability. I mean, 36% in five years. And it's just a real challenge. And so utilities are not only faced with trying to be financially sustainable, but still remain affordable for their customers. It's driving us to think about how can we do more with less. We're starting to see more partnerships form, more collaboration, so that we can create better efficiencies within the way that we manage water to be able to hopefully um, pass those, those uh, savings on to, on to customers. So I was talking with Rob McCandless, who's um, one of my counterparts here in, in Arizona, to help me understand a little bit about what that looks like for you here in the state. Uh, of Arizona. And so I learned a little bit about the fact that, like many places, you're seeing population growth and development. Um, potential uh, issues with respect to the reliability of surface supplies. Um, is that a fair assessment? Seeing some nothing heads, good. Um, some potential restrictions on cap deliveries in the future. And groundwater overdraft and declining groundwater quality. Real issues. Um, and then, you know, just this overarching need, which I know that, John, you, you already touched on this, the need for water supply diversification, augmenting supplies, um, and uh, maybe some potential for potable reuse now through some of the regulatory changes that, is, that have been put forth. Is there anything else that, I, that I'm missing that is driving you to this one water conversation? Regulations, more stringent regulations, or regulations creating more opportunities? Well, I mean, we have reached uh, safety yield in our area, right? mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have a broad diversity of supplies to do. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, the the uh, the drivers toward reuse, and I, I sometimes because I'm a reuse specialist, I, I I have to be careful that I don't immediately go there as a solution because there are a number of different solutions. We hear a lot of solutions with respect to stormwater capture and and decentralized systems and and these types of things as well. Um, but yeah, the the reuse is an interesting um, and and sort of foundational conversation within One Water because it's such a good example of that collaborative um, kind of combining of or connecting the dots within the urban water cycle to be able to accomplish your goals. All right. So um, all in all, there's, there's obvious drivers that are moving us in a direction of um, thinking about water in new ways, doing business, the business of water in new ways. And one water can really be a nice solution to, to moving in, in that direction. So um, this, this roadmap that I mentioned that we developed um, was really in essence to try and capture what are the, what are the basic steps that, that and I, I'm going to say an entity because it, it really could be a collaborative group. It could be an agency that's driving it. It could be, um, you know, a, a collection of, of in, you know, professionals um, and stakeholders within a certain region. But um, these are the, the steps that an entity might go through in order to um, plan for and implement a one water approach. I'm going to go through each of these phases, and I'll be speaking about um, sort of the, the through the case studies that we looked at. Um, to try and illustrate some of these steps that we might go through. Don't hesitate to stop me along the way if you want to dig into a specific step. We're going to start by um, kind of getting on the path to one water, beginning with setting the foundation, establishing direction, and we're going to talk about engaging stakeholders. Right off the bat, you'll notice that engaging stakeholders is like 
through the entire thing. It's not really a phase of the, in and of itself. I call it the river that runs through it. And this was something initially when we got to the workshop, we, we had it like right in here. We thought, okay, you're going to set the thing. You're going to figure some things out. You're going to go to your stakeholders. They're going to help get you straight, and then you're going to keep moving forward. But all the agencies we talked to were like, nah, uh, uh You've got to have them involved from the get-go, and they're going to become your champions. They're going to be there through the end. They're going to be the ones that help um, with the success of the program. And so, um, so that became a phase that just carried through. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these. Um, don't feel like you need to read this. This is not to be read. But it is um, just an example of what you'll find within the blueprint. Um, by the way, this blueprint is a document. I actually have a couple of them. Um, of examples I might pass around and you're welcome to take a look at. And I'll leave them for you guys so that you can have it this time. But I'll start on both sides of the table. But basically, um, this is what you'll get with each of the steps along the way. A brief definition of what we're talking about and then important actions that might be taken within each step. You also see in each step a um, key outcomes and potential challenges. So the key outcome just gives you an, a sense of what am I hoping to accomplish as I go through this step. And then the potential challenges um, came from, from agencies who have gone through this and were like, you know, keep in mind that you may get hung up in these ways. So hopefully that will help you be thinking about that as you enter into each of these steps. Um, I'll also note that not every action will be taken for, for any given entity. But um, we tried to kind of organize this in such a way that you can start to see some of the most important actions right up front. All right, so um, actually before I go there, this, um, this is the very first step, defining what One Water is. And so we touched on that a little bit when I showed you the map. Um, it's just an important starting point. Um, once you figure out what One Water is, what you're out to accomplish using a One Water approach, um, that's when you can start to identify and convene partners. That without these partners, you wouldn't necessarily be able to accomplish your goal as effectively or as efficiently. So that's really who you're trying to identify. And the, the key outcome here is to, to, to get to an agreement, um, some sort of statement of support of um, how you're going to jointly pursue one or whatever that, that issue that you're trying to tackle is. And then once you identify and convene partners, Starting to assess the needs and opportunities. Where might you um, come together uh, to collaborate and integrate? Um, and so eventually you get to the point where you have a better understanding of the needs, the goals, the opportunities for, um, for working together and, and creating some efficiencies um, and synergies between the partners. A really good example of this is the Bay Area Regional Reliability Partnership. Um, Brenna Caldwell's actually been involved in, um, in carrying these folks through the development of a drought contingency plan. Um, and we had one of the partner agencies. There's, this, is made, this partnership is actually made up of eight different agencies in the Bay Area that are working together um, to improve water supply reliability in the region and leveraging their own infrastructure as a group um, to better accomplish that task. And so I mean, you can imagine eight different agencies each with their own agendas, their own budgets, their own way of doing things, their own culture, coming together and deciding that for this greater good, they're going to, to share and leverage um, their resources. And so we had Margaret Patil from Contra Costa Water District, which is one of those agencies, show up. And it was really moving and kind of hilarious also the way she described how exciting and tear invoking it was to get all eight of them to sign on to one memorandum of agreement. But what that allowed them to do is really accomplish goals that they wouldn't have otherwise done. But it required that they really think about what, are the, what is the common goal that they're trying to strive towards and what are some guiding principles that will help them choose how to participate as part of this collective. Um, so I pulled out some of the words from this memorandum of understanding. Things like sharing information and working cooperatively. Um, committing staff time and, and this, this term equitable and that meant equitable in terms of the time that staff was engaging or the, the investment that people were making. Um, and so uh, being more inclusive 
um, taking that regional approach, being transparent, and taking a, a balanced view of the whole water cycle. All right, so from there, once you've set that foundation, the next step is crafting a vision and objectives. Um, so in this case, we're talking about a really high-level document, something that just says this is what we're up to accomplish, and these are the objectives that we've got in, in tackling this work together. Um, so there's some really, there are a lot of great examples that I could highlight here. I think um, LA has a really nice example of a, of a vision for One Water. You'll, you'll see an example of that in the blueprint um, as, that they developed as part of their LA One Water plan. But um, we actually got to participate in developing this for the New York City DEP, so I included them as a, as a good example because I also think that it is an example of a type of framework that um, some people don't think about when they think about developing these plans. Oftentimes when people think about these one water plans, there's, it seems like this, oh, we've got to come up with this whole comprehensive plan. Shoot, I've already just done a master plan, and now I have to do another master plan, and this seems like a lot more effort than we want to go through. Um, but in New York, um, it really was that, you know, they have, they're a massive bureaucracy. They've got... Um, they, they provide water to um, 9 million residents. They, uh, they have nine bureaus. Five of them are water and wastewater related from capital projects to planning and operations. Um, it's massive. And each of those bureaus, as well as the mayor's department and other city agencies, they come up with all these different sustainability initiatives all of them on their own, and they're all developed in silos, and many of them are conflicting in terms of um, the amount of funds that are necessary, where they, how, how they're going to get the, these um, initiatives accomplished. And so um, their goal was to use One Water to help them create a unifying framework, something that would allow them to um, identify where to best integrate, what to focus on, and how to get efficiencies rather than developing a whole new plan. Um, and so we worked with them um, to, to develop a, a workshop actually the day after we held the workshop for the Blueprint for One Water. We, we brought them all together, each of the bureaus, representatives from each of their bureaus, as well as um, regulatory agencies and, and um, city agencies to determine what one water looked like for them, what they were going to focus on, um, and uh, out of that workshop, they were able to generate a vision and a set of guiding principles that they were going to work within. And so um, they also decided that they were going to need to have some internal champions in order to drive this forward. So out of their planning, one of their planning bureaus, they um, developed a group that they the integrated water management group that they now look to to lead in this effort moving forward. Um, there are two things that they were focusing on was stormwater management and green infrastructure, as well as um, really how to maintain, how to manage all of these initiatives, um, but with the understanding of the importance of state of good repair and investing there. So how do we prioritize the state of good repair while making smart decisions about the sustainability of their water system. All right, now engaging stakeholders, another really important key spot. Um, this is all about um, engagement with a variety of different stakeholders, both internally and externally. Um, you know, and externally it might be elected officials, it might be regulating bodies, it might be special interest groups or technical advisors. Um, people in the community that are really interested. Eventually, these, these people um, and some of the agencies that we spoke to actually talked about how important it was that they bring together a really diverse group of individuals and to pick people that they knew might be naysayers as well. The, the people who are going to need to have a voice to be heard, and then as soon as they felt like they were able to provide input and they were heard, then they became some of the best champions for whatever it was that they were up to. Um, this is a, like I said, there was a lot of really good examples that I could give on this particular topic. Um, 
everyone actually that, that participated in this workshop acknowledged the importance for them of having a strong stakeholder group and stakeholder engagement. Um, I, I brought this one up just because I don't think we've talked about anyone Midwest yet. Um, the Mid-Ohio Regional um, uh, Pollution or something, Planning Commission, um, and they had developed a watershed-based assessment of climate change adaptation strategies, and it was a collaboration with six different utilities. Um, they actually, in order to accomplish their goal of being able to secure safe drinking water um, for uh, for uh, the, their Ohio region, Central Ohio, for now and into the future, they developed a 26-member stakeholder advisory group. And that group, I'm going to actually need to go to my notes here, that group involved representatives from public utilities, agriculture, transportation, environmental advocacy groups, private industry, and municipal offices. So they really, they kind of covered the gamut of what, you know, the key stakeholders for these issues. And um, and so together, they, they were looking at um, assessing risks in agriculture, wastewater treatment, water quality, water supply, um, transportation, water treatment, public health, energy, the environment, and the economy. And they were able to collectively come up with a set of adaptation strategies that then were able to help them move toward greater uh, water resources security into the future. All right. Now we get into the meat of developing the framework itself. Um, there's a number of different steps here, including um, establishing lasting leadership and an institutional structure that will sustain the work that is being done, creating the framework or a plan, conducting adaptation, uh, adaptive planning, and then developing financing strategies. So um, this, is a, this is a graphic that we developed in the process of, of working through the development of this blueprint. Um, and I, I put it up here for a couple of different reasons. One, this is actually, speaking of stakeholder engagement, a nice way of being able to convey what it is you're up to. You may not be doing all of these things, but it's kind of a nice way of, of helping uh, the community recognize all of the, the different aspects of the urban water cycle and where you're working on closing the loop and kind of creating better reliability within the system. Um, and, uh, but it also, it, it is a, um, you know, the, the, the type of thing that you're going to be focused on, like I said, is going to be different from one place to the next. Um, and as a result, of that, as well as the fact that you may have a difference between the scope of the plan that you develop, whether it's a comprehensive plan or a just a unifying framework, something that says, you know, this is what we're going to tackle together, um, it's going to impact the, the type of resources that are necessary. And a lot of the questions that we got um, as we were going through this process was, well, what does it take to develop this type of a framework. And I don't want to scare anybody off with these numbers. Know that these are all facilities and or agencies that were participating that were fairly sophisticated, bigger agencies that had the, um, the you know, the ability to, to move forward with a project or a program like this um, early on. And so um, we absolutely believe that this is very scalable. This is something that you can do as a smaller agency or entity, um, as well as a bigger agency. But this gives you a little bit of uh, an idea of what that looks like. All right. So um, in terms of developing lasting leadership and an institutional structure that will um, carry forward, a really good example of that is the Orange County Water District and Orange County Sanitation District. The partnership that they formed to um, plan for, design, and construct the groundwater replenishment system in Orange County. This is now currently a 100 million gallon a day potable reuse facility, um, and it is currently being expanded to 130 million gallons a day. The reason that this has been so successful is because of the way that they came together from the very beginning to look at how can we accomplish our mutual goals um, or our separate goals in a way that's mutually beneficial. And the partnership takes the shape of uh, the GWRS Steering Committee. It's a board that 
um, we've got three board members from Orange County Water District and three board members from Orange County Sanitation District. And they're the ones that work together to basically make decisions on the groundwater replenishment system. And it is through that continued uh, partnership and steering committee that they have come now up with their third expansion. Um, and uh, and it, it, so it really has created a, a very sustainable um, uh, structure for them to carry this, their, their mission forward. It's a great slogan. Which one? Yeah, it tastes like water because it's Isn't it? I know. Because it's water. <laughs> I agree. Have, has anybody actually been to the um, groundwater replenishment system? Have you tasted the water? Okay. Isn't it the best tasting water? Uh, it was until the AZ Pure Water. Well, there's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't drink that water. I only had the beer. So... <laughs> but it was great tasting beer. <laughs> and if there's any water, I'll take them home. I do. I need some for the flight. So, um, all right, so now financing, that's the other big, you know, elephant in the room. How do we get these things financed? And part of One Water is getting creative and coming up with creative strategies, which in some ways, because of the nature of these um, uh, programs and approaches, that it creates a more collaborative scenario where you can come up with some interesting strategies. Um, one example is the Philadelphia Water Department. They... Um, they were developing a 25-year plan, the Green City Clean Water Program, and it was all about transforming the landscape of uh, Philadelphia's urban environment. Um, this was really about stormwater management and green infrastructure, and they're trying to incentivize the development of um, this green infrastructure. And so what they, what they did was they really partnered with the developers themselves. Um, they were able to generate some revenue out of a stormwater fee, but those developers that implemented their own green infrastructure were given credits, um, stormwater credits. And so that incentivized partners to come to the table, even when the, the price tag of uh, these plans started to, to um, get a little bit bigger than expected, which is what I've heard recently, there's still a number of partners at the table because it is a mutually beneficial uh, approach. And then as well, grant programs, um, you know, grants is another opportunity. Adaptation strategies um, from Denver Water, they're a great example of, of looking at planning in, this, in the midst of deep uncertainty. Um, they really embrace the concept of uncertainty. And a lot of the reason for these one water approaches is because we're planning in the midst of tremendous uncertainty um, due to climate change and other factors. And so how can we develop plans that make sense and are cost effective um, when we're planning for things that we can't fully predict? Um, so Denver Water did this as part of their ongoing integrated resource plan. They looked at water demand projections, demand management alternatives, and water supply options, water supply diversification. And their focus is on figuring out where are they truly deficient when they start to look at a variety of different scenarios. And it allowed them to determine what are their no regrets strategies, and then what are some long-term strategies that they can maybe, um, you know, that might be triggered by certain types of uh, scenarios becoming clear. And so they can revisit this ongoingly as well. And finally, implementation. Um, the implementation is, uh, one thing I'll note here is that you, you see this feedback loop. This feedback loop actually is something that is an ongoing kind of scenario. It, it, one of the things that we heard from our workshop participants were um, start small but start. Don't wait until the whole thing is done. Just start. Um, because a lot of these projects, you'll see the low-hanging fruit that just starts to make sense and we move forward with, and it can help to inform the plan itself as it's being developed, and it also can help stakeholders get excited and energetic and they start to see and become champions for the work that you're trying to do. A um, couple of examples of, of folks in implementation. Uh, SFPC, actually, they were developing their vision for One Water as we were going through the process of developing the blueprint for, for One Water. So it was nice. As we were finishing up our blueprint, they had recently finished up their One Water SF plan. 
Um, and for them, it's all about implementing a roadmap and, and using that roadmap to help prioritize different activities. Um, they, they were looking at new opportunities for projects and programs, figuring out where they wanted to do greater, more research, and looking at where are their partnership opportunities. One example that I'll uh, just touch on that SFPUC is very involved in is the concept of decentralized systems. They're um, really leading uh, in the area. They've developed a blue ribbon panel on this topic. They have their own living machine at their own headquarters that are basically looking at opportunities to reuse um, rainwater, stormwater, um, looking at opportunities in terms of foundation drainage as well as gray water and black water reuse. Um, all of these opportunities combined can help to achieve up to 50% water savings um, in residential buildings. And this is on the building or district, uh, district scale in San Francisco in particular. There's a lot of new development happening and a lot of developers who are really excited about the opportunity to be branded as sort of their own little ecosystem, and it's a, you know, it, it, it's an interesting approach. Um, but so at, at the residential scale, uh, re, uh, replacing um, potable water for, uh, for things like toilet flushing and irrigation and, and washing clothes. Um, in, uh, in office buildings, maybe even using it for, in addition to toilets, looking at using it for cooling towers and um, irrigation. In, in offices, especially if you're using it for things like cooling towers and, and um, HVAC, it can really achieve a significant savings up to 95%. So there's some really interesting opportunities here. And yet, even SFPUC is recognizing that when you factor these decentralized systems into the whole centralized infrastructure and the whole urban water cycle, there are implications of moving in this direction as well. So it takes a real one water approach, a very collaborative approach to be able to do this and do it effectively um, while minimizing the potential impacts. The other thing about implementation that we've heard is you've got to have metrics, you've got to be able to track progress, and I encourage you to look at what simple metrics might be that are really effective at communicating with stakeholders. Um, this is a really good example. Orange County, they have this ticker tape that goes on their website. And it just, it tracks how much water has been produced through the system. And it's such a nice way for the community, the stakeholders, the elected officials to be like, that's what success looks like. And so that's, that's an important takeaway that we found. We like, we as engineers, we like all this, you know, detailed stuff. But sometimes when it comes to communicating success, Coming up with a real base metric is, is a smart move. So I'm going to stop there for now before talking about anything related to declining flows. Just to see, does anybody have any thoughts, any questions? Is this, you know, is this helpful for what you guys are, are up to right now? I'm looking at you, John. All right. Well. <laughs> Well, if I can make a comment just based on the information you shared and, and other knowledge, I'm going to go back to, to take pride in some of Arizona's successes. I think the, the 1980 Groundwater Management Act were established the AMAs. That was maybe a crude attempt at this, but it's a very successful one. It set metrics for the industries within certain watersheds to reach certain you know, points of success in, in whatever their integrated water management strategy is. By the year 2025, we brought up the thing. So I think I think we have the right attitude, and we have some of the right uh, starting information within the state, or because we've all been kind of living it already. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm excited where where the next steps will be, uh, where we go as a as a community of the state of Arizona. But uh, it, again, it seems like we hopped on that integrated water management strategy several years ago when we had our groundwater management challenges. I think it's an excellent point, and in fact, it's funny when I'm um, just, this is like a, just an anecdote along those lines. The, the perspective of the people that live here in Arizona, when, when we talk about what's going on in California about potable reefs, and we talk about, you know, groundwater recharge and all of this stuff, and have you guys thought about doing it? I, I heard that. Have you guys thought about doing that in Arizona? They're like, that's what we've been doing for years. We've been doing 
Yeah. It, like this is like it's a no brainer at this point. And so you have a mentality already of integrated water management. This almost ends up being like a formality, putting a you know, a structure to what you already have you already come to the table with this type of an approach. I would just say, you know, this group is um, was formed out of the Governor's Water Augmentation Council, and so obviously in Arizona we're looking at augmentation and sources of supply for, for augmenting. Has your experience been, and I know from the map you showed us that everybody's looking at from something different, would your experience be that in, in some of these case studies, it doesn't necessarily look like they're doing it to augment supply, but it might be better using um, things that are wasted or, you know, but not being driven by the need to do that. Um, is your perspective that there are any other states or areas that are ex experiencing this, this push, I mean, truly from the augmentation perspective and not necessarily from the green perspective? Oh, absolutely. And it's funny, it's actually really interesting to hear this comment because that means that there is, you know, it, it's an interesting uh, perspective. When we first started this conversation with folks, there was concern that we were we were focusing too much on the areas that needed to look at supply reliability and augmenting supply, um, because there's people taking an, a one water approach to other things like stormwater management and green infrastructure and things of that nature. And so we wanted to make sure that we did provide more of that balanced look. And so it didn't look like when water was only necessary when you had to look at supply reliability. Or, and it's not just important in places where water is here. But you might notice, and you know, I pulled case studies, I, you know, purposefully for the selected case studies that covered that range. Um, from folks that were um, needing additional supplies to folks that had an abundance of supplies. Um, because it is an approach that works across the board, but I think a lot of the agencies that we asked to participate in the workshop were had already implemented a one water approach because they were short on supplies and they needed to look at greater supply reliability or um, you know, and there, so, so you had folks like LA who participated, and it was all about trying to identify ways to augment their supplies through any any way imaginable. Um, their LA One Water Plan was all about looking at potable reuse in a number of different ways, including groundwater recharge and direct potable reuse, and um, stormwater as a resource, looking at opportunities to uh, capture stormwater. In some cases, they were looking at integrating stormwater and reuse opportunities, um, any way that they could find to augment their supplies. And especially in uh, areas where local supplies are really scarce. So folks like, in, California is a lot like that. Most of Southern California takes water from other areas, San Diego and, and LA. I mean, in San Diego, I'll speak from personal experience, we have 85 to 90 percent of our supplies are imported. And so their one water approach, which was captured in the blueprint, was all about augmenting supplies through potable reuse. Um, and in their case, it was surface water augmentation because they don't have a really great groundwater resource to work with. So it's really identifying what do you have to work with and how can you best leverage those local supplies. And in many cases where there isn't a great groundwater basin or surface water supplies, potable reuse is the way to go. Um, or at least using recycled water in a way that um, significantly offsets potable supplies. In places like SFPC, um, you know, they, they don't have very many great places to put it. They also have this excellent supply source that is suddenly at risk because we're not getting as much snow as we used to have. So there's a lot of discussion up in Northern California about storage, and that's their one water issue, either storage or finding decentralized approaches because of the, the um, uh, space saving that that can, that, that can offer. Um, so it really just depends. When you talk about supply augmentation, there are absolutely probably more examples of agencies that are doing it for that reason. Any other, other questions? Stuff? Um, 
I just want to make a comment, I guess, about the uh, time scale mm -hmm. and uh, what uh, Chairman Smith was uh, talking about. We started uh, a program 40, almost so, going to hit kind of our first milestone after 45 years. You know, how we hit these goals. Yeah. And uh, I think it's significant because it allowed Arizona to have a soft landing rather than what I'm seeing some of these communities in your example doing is they went to the web edge. They had to address something because of the emergency situation. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is I think Arizona's approach to staff allowed to have that soft landing, do things that aren't so uh, you know, dramatic, draconian, or whatever. And we're, we're reaching that, that year 2025 uh, milestone. What are we as a state going to do for the next 45 years? So, so I'd rather have the one water approach beyond you know, a, a longer time scale with uh, more opportunities to react and adjust. I think that that's a, a great. Uh, a great comment and actually very reflective of, of some of the um, current work that's being done right now. These are, these are long-term planning strategies that might have short-term projects and programs that are offshoots of it. Like in LA, they've, they just wrapped up their, um, their One Water LA planning effort, but they had already been working on some of the potable reuse projects, you know, five years ago. Um, that were the low-hanging fruit that they know that they can move forward with. Um, I'd also say that this, as I mentioned, this iterative approach that we talked about is what allows, it's sort of what I, I, I see you already have done um, in terms of water management in Arizona. When you were talking about how, you know, decades ago you implemented solutions that now you, you revisit over time to make sure that it still makes sense for you and you can tweak and adjust accordingly. And that's really what this is all about. Um, I think the most sustainable approach is to look at this as not a one-time planning effort, but an ongoing planning effort that can be modified and tweaked to make the most sense for you along the way. Great comment. Any other questions on this particular topic? Is anyone dealing with declining flows um, in terms of their overall operation of water, wastewater, recycled water systems? Is that something, is that a topic that's relevant to the folks at this table or outside the table? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I operate a smaller system in, in, in Marana, but in all of the county. We've noticed, uh, well, not me operating, but knowing the Pima <laughs> County area, uh, we've noticed with the growth and efficiencies mm -hmm. through development areas, low flush toilets, you know, shower heads, all that, there's, well, because we still have growth, it's not necessarily declining flows, but the flows we are getting are highly concentrated. Yep. And they're nutrient loading, yep. which is a result from those efficiencies. Mm -hmm. so, the, so even though the, the it's not as not as dramatic as it used to be in the past as far as the increase in flows, but the increase in concentrations of those items you need to treat for are making it uh, wastewater treatment much more energy um, use of, you know, using it lots of energy now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so it we're seeing something very similar in California, and I I brought um, I brought some slides from a white paper that we just developed because I thought. As you're looking at this kind of one water approach, this is one of those um, issues that we're seeing when you look at the water, urban water cycle as a whole, and you start to look at augmenting supplies. You're augmenting supplies in the face of a, maybe a decline in flows, or perhaps if you're having great growth, it is more of an increase in concentrations and how that might then impact the choices that you make in terms of supply augmentation. Um, would it be of interest to go into some of what we've just done in California? Okay. Um, so, and if you have questions about the one water blueprint that comes up in the conversation, don't hesitate to stop and we can still talk about that. But um, in addition to working at Brown and Caldwell, I work as a staff engineer for the California Urban Water Agencies. And, um, 
and they are a uh, collective of 11 major urban water agencies in California. They collectively serve drinking water to over two-thirds of California's population, and they're we're sort of a, a compilation. Initially, it was just like SoCal and NorCal, but since, I, since this map was put together, we actually added the city of Fresno, and they give us a nice Central Valley. They kind of bridge the gap in Central Valley, and they give us a little more of an inland perspective as well. Um, but you know, their their mission is ultimately to provide a, a forum, largely about information sharing and also informing um, uh, the state and other entities um, in in a, uh, areas of, of particular concern related to advancing reliable, high quality water supplies. Um, in the state to meet current and future water demands um, in a cost-effective manner for the public, the environment, and the economy. So they really do take this kind of one water approach to things. And a couple of our agencies who provide more than just water services, but also wastewater and recycle water services, raised their hand um, several months ago, and, and this is in the midst of California's state policy um, being considered related to water use efficiency targets, indoor water use targets being set at levels that were um, kind of much lower than uh, they, some of these agencies felt were sustainable for their own system because of the potential impact of declining flows. So we agreed to look at um, some research in that arena. We developed a white paper that looked at the implications of declining flows and how agencies were having to adapt these issues. We don't advocate as an agency or as an association, we don't advocate for any one thing, but it was an important topic that needed to be informed just in terms of that practical perspective from the utilities. And so what we um, set out to do was um, to leverage the utility observations um, in order to offer a bit of a preview into the potential impact of setting indoor water use with uh, indoor water use targets that were at or below the thresholds that were achieved when the governor of California set forth emergency mandates for conservation during the drought. So we had really low mandate, a mandate to get really low in terms of our water use and Californians absolutely responded. But now it looks like they're trying to have that long-term strategy be at those same levels. So that's where some of this concern came from. And um, the, the whole, you know, uh, you've seen this before, and it's because we really wanted to, to emphasize the fact that it, if you don't consider this interconnected urban water cycle, then you um, might miss an opportunity to better optimize water management in the future for the state. And so that's really what this was all about. And the research showed that it indeed had Quite a, this decline in flows had an impact on the drinking water distribution system, the wastewater conveyance, wastewater treatment, and recycle water. Now, that's not to say that there aren't significant benefits of water use efficiency. In fact, wise water use is an absolutely essential ingredient for any of the, our areas that are um, in arid regions where water is scarce. And Kua is fully supportive of conservation and um, water use efficiency. But the bottom line was is that we have to make sure that everybody is thinking about the interconnected nature of the cycle in order to make sure that we're setting informed policy statewide. And so we pulled together a number of collaborative partners. We got CASA, which is the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, and CWEA representing that wastewater perspective, Water Reuse California. Um, that offered that recycle water perspective, and then Water Research Foundation and the Association of um, California Water Agencies bringing in that um, that drinking water perspective. And so uh, through this, we were we were our, our main goal was to just better inform, better understand the implications of of decreasing flows. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, we really just we're, we're breaking out conservation and water use efficiency. Conservation being more short term and emergency in nature, water use efficiency being a more long term sustainable approach. Um, we know that a lot of agencies and, and, and entities look at conservation as both, but just for the purpose of being clear what we were speaking about, we, we differentiated there. Um, 
And then we were focused mostly on indoor water use because it was that indoor water use that impacted the engineered infrastructure most significantly. So we pulled together a literature review that looked at um, identifying some of the potential issues in each of these systems, and we focused that research both um, in the states California as well as nationally, and then we also did um, find quite a bit internationally. So um, Arizona, who had just come through their um, millennium drought, they had a lot of interesting experience related to this topic that we were able to leverage as well. Oh, and then we did a, a high-level survey as and um, some one-on-one -on -one interviews with different utilities to be able to kind of round out the various perspectives. We went a little bit deeper, or able to go a little deeper on what they were experiencing, what the financial impact was. Yes? I just have a question. You said we just came through the millennium drought. Australia did. Oh, I, I thought you said Arizona. I was going to say we are in year 18 of the state declared drought emergency in Arizona. And we are looking at a mega drought, the likes of which we haven't seen since the Middle Ages. So. When you talk about conservation being a short-term emergency strategy, I would suggest that at least some of us don't see it as a short-term, we see it as a long-term. Oh, absolutely. And let me be clear here. Um, this water long-term water use efficiency strategy, mm -hmm. this is absolutely um, essential. And right. both, of, both of these are essential to water supply reliability. It is... Um, the benefits that we get out of implementing both of these are critical. Our agencies were trying to differentiate from this as right. a long term where do we want to be so that when we have an emergency, which it sounds like you're still in the middle of, <laughs> but for us, point. we just, you know, it <laughs> rained last year, which was nice. Um, wanting the ability to then have a buffer so that we can, in an emergency scenario, really ratchet it down. Mm -hmm. So that's the distinction that they wanted to make with, mm -hmm. it isn't, this This is the long term, this is all the time, we want to be really wise with our water use, and then this is, when things get really bad, we want to know that we can go even further if we have to. Mm -hmm. So that's the distinction, does that yes, help? Mm -hmm. um, but you're absolutely right. And I, I, I this is a, an interesting topic because for CUA, we actually have a planning and conservation committee, and um, for I mean, for years, the, the biggest driver was to make sure that um, these agencies were helping to drive the conversation in uh, the conversation in conservation. Um, and that is it, when we first started uh, dipping our toe in this topic. It was a really difficult conversation for some of them to have because we really didn't want it to seem like we were saying don't do conservation. Mm -hmm. The key here is how do we do conservation and water use efficiency in a way that doesn't negatively impact the other important strategies that we want to put in place, like groundwater augmentation, like recycled water, things of that nature. So um, so our, uh, we, we went out, got about 270 responses to our survey, um, and about 74 distinct utilities out of all of those respondents. So we obviously we got some duplications. But almost everybody said that they had some impact. Uh, almost every one of those agencies had experienced some impact. Um, and they covered water, recycled water, and water services, as well as some others like flood control, and then a range of different size facilities, from small to, uh, to large facilities, over a hundred, uh, uh, over a million um, population served. And the responses covered a broad range geographically. So the dark markers are those agencies that responded and said, yes, indeed, they had seen impact in one or another of their systems. And the white markers, those four white markers, said, no, I haven't had any issues. And so um, we then dug a little bit deeper and did one-on-one -on -one interviews with nine different utilities that did say that they had some sort of an impact. And um, you can see from their marker, um, we talked to folks who covered a range of different services, and there were a range of different sizes based on the size of those little markers. Um, of all of the survey respondents, they, it ended up being actually about half that said, yes, we have seen implications. 
Um, and some of that could, you know, the, dif the difference between what we saw in terms of the distinct utilities saying that 70 out of 74 said yes versus the actual respondents might just be an issue of those that were operationally focused versus not within their systems. But um, what we found was most folks thought in the drinking water systems, about 60% um, versus um, wastewater conveyance and treatment being close behind just over 50% and recycled water systems having impacts uh, following close behind. Some of the issues that people are seeing, and I'd be interested in seeing if this is what any of you have experienced in the past, in the drinking water distribution systems, they're seeing um, changes in water quality, um, largely nitrification, sometimes reductions in chlorine residuals due to um, increased water age. Now they're spending more time in the distribution system. Um, and so that means that they've got to do more flushing. Uh, wastewater conveyance, uh, a reduction in flow is causing more uh, blockages and settling out, which is causing um, more hydrogen sulfide production, which has impacts with respect to odors, um, odor complaints corrosion, exacerbated um, an increased rate of corrosion, and then of course the O&M issues and implications that go along with that. On the wastewater treatment side, we're seeing changing influent water quality increases in things like ammonia, we heard a lot, um, and that then requires that in order to meet their compliance requirements, they've got to change and adjust their operations. Um, and then on the recycled water side, uh, especially under certain um, uh, certain circumstances, they may be seeing a reduction in recycled water production and um, an impact on the water quality. So higher salinity, for instance, in their recycled water, which is then um, impacting the end users. So that's sort of, we, we identified this range of different um, potential impacts, and then we asked the survey respondents to give us a sense of what they were actually experiencing. Um, of those respondents that said, yes, indeed, we do have an issue in our drinking water system, um, about 49% of them reported operational challenges within their system. They needed to do more flushing, they, they had issues with their chlorine residual at the end of the pipe, that type of thing. So um, just a, a quick uh, example, a case study of what is happening um, in San Diego along these lines, they have seen, this is the San Diego County Water Authority, which they manage about 150 square miles of pipe. They, they're a wholesaler, so they bring water, um, uh, imported water into San Diego, and they serve 3.3 million people. They've got 24 member agencies. And what they saw was they were seeing re reduction in chlorine residuals within their system and um, increased nitrification. And so they had to increase the flushing, which cost them anywhere from 200000 to $2 million a year. And so they were just, and, you know, we wanted to try and capture the actual financial implications of some of this because that's going to help drive, you know, how, how do you best then figure out how to manage that scenario. Um, and then they were increasing their online monitoring in order to adjust that. On the wastewater side, um, of those that said, yes, I do have, I am impacted in terms of my wastewater conveyance system, about 50% said they had issues with odor, solids, and O&M problems. And the corrosion, less so, but, um, from some of the conversations that we had, the case studies are saying it's almost, because this reduction, significant reduction due to the emergency mandate that the governor put forth, that was like 2015, 2016, some of the folks said, we don't, we expect to have issues in, in terms of corrosion, but we haven't necessarily seen it as much. <coughs> um, so, so that's still yet to come. And then on the treatment side, 68% of those that said they were impacted in terms of wastewater treatment said that um, they experienced changes in their influence quality. So John, kind of along the lines of what you were saying, increased ammonia, increased, um, uh, and that, that's causing implications in terms of how they operate their systems and what they need to do, what they need to invest in in order to achieve their goals. Couple of interesting examples in terms of the collection system. This is a small system, Tuolumne Utility District, and um, so they only they only provide um, services to about 44,000 residents. 
They're only treating about 1.2 million gallons a day. Most of their system, most of their infrastructure is like four to six inch pipe. So it's prone to blockages already. And indeed, they saw when flows declined, they had more blockages causing an increase in sewer, uh, sanitary sewer overflow. And they also saw an increase in root intrusion. I don't know if anybody here has experienced that as an issue, but they were like, I feel like it's because of either reduction in flows or the drought, but they hadn't quite figured out the mechanism yet. But they said as a result of the root intrusion, we're having to do uh, invest significantly in proactive pipe patching so that they can counter any of those issues. They can't afford to lose that water, and they don't want to cause any additional more sewer overflows. <laughs> but um, I think Victor Valley is one I wanted to just touch on, and then we can wrap this up. Um, uh, related to uh, recycled water and and um, and actual water supply augmentation, this is an example um, where you know they're a they're a system that discharges into a river, and so they're required to discharge a certain amount to the river. And as a result, when the flows started to decline, they had less to produce recycled water. And so when their end users were getting less recycled water, they're going to the groundwater supplies. And so it's kind of like exactly what you don't want to have happen. And all of this just to say that the importance of that, keeping that one water perspective in mind, the interconnectedness of this water cycle, it just, it's um, the whole really emphasis of this white paper became it's important to be thinking about that in your planning efforts, to be thinking about that when we start to look at water supply reliability and all the levers that we can pull. Water supply diversification and, and water augmentation is an important one, yet we're doing that in the midst of a decrease in, in flows, possibly an increase in, in concentrations. It's going to change the way that we manage things. And um, so, so I'll stop there, and um, oh, this is just kind of confirming exactly what uh, we expected to see, is that 70% of those that said, yes, I have seen impact in my recycled water system, we're seeing an impact to production. And so just something to keep in the back of your mind as you're working in this direction. Growth, as long as you're seeing significant growth, it may not come across in flows, but there's certainly impacts in terms of quality, that you know, you'll be managing as you bring in alternative supplies. And I'll stop there. Yeah. So I have a question on the, did you go one step further and ask the utilities, at least the wastewater utilities, what types of infrastructure are the ones that had problems with nitrification or, or you know, denitrification, did you, you know, the higher ammonia loads? Mm -hmm. Did you go one step further or was just kind of just a snapshot of just trying to find out is there what's the issue? Great question. So um, we didn't in this round, and we recently had a meeting with the State Water Resources Control Board in California who was really pleased to get this kind of insight and actually asked, is there more that you're going to do or could you do to look at better understanding the characteristics of these systems that are having impacts and what, you know, what are some of the, the details associated. Our first our V1 of our survey was like a 10-page detailed, I want to know everything about your system so we can assess it all. And then we got, you know, the reality check that was like nobody is going to answer that survey. And so we made it like a five-minute survey that everybody would answer, and we actually got responses. But then we heard from um, some of the people that were reviewing this through some of our collaborative partners. And they were like, I didn't see myself on the list. I didn't see my agency, but we have all these experiences that are like these. We want to, we, we want to be on the list. And um, and I said, well, you you got you got the survey from like two different associations. And he was like, oh yeah, but it was a real survey heavy summer, so they didn't respond. And we've kept the survey going so that people could weigh in. We may 
mine this a little bit further. We we actually one of the things the state board wanted us to look at as well is um, to uh, correlate those that that said that they did have impact with the percentage that they were required to decrease um, or to the the increase in conservation or decrease in water demand within their system because each region had a slightly different percentage that they had to hit. And so we're going to do that. And we're also looking at digging a little deeper in a second round of surveys. Now that people are primed and they know it's going to come and they're willing to engage, we're going to go back to those folks and say, what are some of the specifics of your system? So um, it's, it's a great question, one I wish I could answer right away, but we will hopefully get more information and insight.